But I'd like to turn it over to our next excellent set of, a set of panelists who have the challenge of going through all of uh, the most recent case law and, and uh, uh, synthesize that all down into a digestible <laughs> amount of information for you. So, Susanna, I'll, I'll get it for you. Um, what I'd like to do is introduce our moderator for this panel, Susanna Canseco from Branscom PC. Um, thank you so much for, for leading this, and let's welcome Susanna this morning. Thank you, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. Well, hopefully your coffee has kicked in because we have a full list of cases to go through today. I want to thank our panelists for being here with us this morning. We've got a great panel with us today. I will avoid lengthy introductions of them because we do have so much material to cover, but I will name them. Farthest to my left is True Brewer from... Lloyd Goslink. Then we have Kristen Fancher from Fancher Legal. Uh, next to her is Emily Rogers from Baker Staff Heath Delgado and Acosta. And next to her is Vanessa Puig Williams, attorney at Puig Williams Law. And so, and I invite our panelists to, to add any other biographical information you want to as you first speak. Um, and of course, their biographies are also in our program. And so, as I said, we've got, I think we're going to try to hit about 10 different cases, and these are cases in varying states of, of procedure. You know, we'll, we'll be talking about some that are kind of at the application stage, and then some that have gone all the way up to appellate courts. Some of them have been around for a while. You may have heard about them, but we'll update you on where they are now. Um, others are, are newer in the process. And uh, we've, we've tried to group those in categories that we hope will be interesting and useful to you. We are going to just dive right in because we do have so much to, to discuss. Um, we're going to start with a, a, what we hope will be a, a group discussion about cases that you, you have definitely heard of before, the, the Middle Pecos Groundwater Conservation District cases, both the Fort Stockton Holdings case that's been going on for many years, and then the Republic Water case that has come along more recently. And what I think we're going to start out by having uh, our panelists do is, is Kristen is going to kind of refresh our memories on the background on these cases, and then we'll move into a uh, kind of group discussion on where those cases are right now. So Kristen, if, if you'll give us that background. You bet. Uh, most of us are familiar with this case, so like Susanna said, we'll just give you the very brief overview because it is important to sh tell you how we got here today. So uh, this has been going on since actually even before 2008, but in 2009 there was a permit hearing on the Fort Stockton Holdings case over approximately 49,000 uh, acre feet of groundwater. Um, the district denied the permit application for a number of reasons, and then the suit was brought by the applicant in 2010. There were some procedural issues about whether or not that suit was timely filed, so that took about two years or so in uh, district court to be, and then even the Court of Appeals to be resolved. And then um, the case resumed in district court, and in the district, in the district one in district court in uh, 2015. So um, the suit was appealed to the El Paso Court of Appeals, and that was pending. Meanwhile, you had the Republic Water case that you see on here. You had that applicant file an application for approximately 28,000 acre feet of groundwater. And then you fast forward to this year, 2017, and there is a there was a SOA permit uh, hearing scheduled, and then which was abated due to a settlement. And Troop actually will tell you a little bit more about the settlement. And I think y'all will be interested to hear because it was a really a really landmark thing for my opinion, for GCDs and for, for other applicants and landowners. Right, thanks Kristen. So um, obviously a case that's got a lot of twists and turns and probably the biggest and most interesting twist came this, uh, during the spring uh, when discussions of the settlement um, arose. And uh, so the, the folks from uh, Fort Stockton Holdings and the folks from the district consultants um, all got together and ironed out a very comprehensive and detailed and specifically uh, staged and phased settlement agreement that was uh, vetted locally by the, the folks of the district um, with their stakeholder meetings and, and town hall meetings and was eventually signed uh, by the parties in April of this year. Um, a couple uh, key points from the settlement agreement. First and foremost, um, the, the lower court uh, judgment was vacated and the appeal pending in El Paso court was to be remanded back um, to the district uh, for further proceedings on the original application of, of Fort Stockton Holdings. Uh, the district asked Fort Stockton Holdings to reduce the original requested amount in their permit 
to 28,400 acre feet and simultaneously file with the district an amendment application to amend their uh, existing historic and existing use permits by that same amount, a, a correlating amount, 28,400 acre feet. Uh, which is what the district had, had proposed all along, which is what we thought was consistent with the holding in, in Guitar and uh, was, was a paramount key to the, to the settlement. Uh, in turn, Fort Stockton Holdings requested that the district initiate a rulemaking to amend its management zone one uh, in order to recognize some hydrological differences between the areas of the zone and to uh, establish accept acceptable aquifer fluctuations and thresholds for pro rata cutbacks uh, in aquifer production. Uh, Fort Stockton Holdings also agreed to donate four uh, of its own wells to the district's monitoring program. And uh, I think most importantly, the, the district and Fort Stockton Holdings negotiated uh, special conditions in the form of um, defined uh, aquifer levels that triggered corresponding cutbacks in production on a percentage basis. Um, I think uh, this, you know, we've heard a lot about uh, regulatory certainty uh, from some of the speakers at this conference, and I think that, you know, this defined um, cutback and corresponding trigger levels is it embodies that regulatory certainty. It's certainty for the district, it's certainty for the, the applicant, the permittee, to know how and when they're going to be cut back, and it provides certainty to uh, the end users of that water as well so they can plan for those events. Um, I think it was Dean Hardberger who spoke to us Tuesday about the difficulties in putting a value on water in this state, particularly due to the fluctuations and the differences in, in water markets across the state in different areas. Uh, so I think, you know, regulatory certainty can help define value, or at least, at the very least, eliminate one of the variabilities in determining value. And that's, that's beneficial to, to all parties. Uh, last and, and not least, the district was, uh, district was allowed to recover uh, all the awards of court costs and expert fees and all the various suits that, that Christian had mentioned uh, from the federal, K, uh, federal court, state court, uh, and other administrative work that had been done. Um, so just uh, really quick to go over kind of a brief timeline of this phased implementation. So in, in March, the discussions uh, began, the settlement was proposed. In April, the district had these uh, the town hall meetings vetted with its local constituents, uh, and eventually the party signed the deal in April. Moving over uh, to May, the motion to uh, vacate and remand was filed in the El Paso Court of Appeals. Uh, moving on to June, Fort Stockton Holdings began to settle with some of the other parties in the case. There was a lot of other uh, governmental entities, uh, counties, water supply districts, uh, utilities that were interveners in the, in the underlying suit. So there was a lot of um, ends to tie up with, with those folks as well. Uh, also in June, the El Paso Court of Appeals uh, granted the motion to vacate and remand, and um, in July the district began and had the remand hearing. Also in July, the district conducted a rulemaking workshop to vet these new changes to management zone one. The remand hearing was held, and uh, the, the simultaneous amendment of the existing historic and existing use permit and granting of a corresponding amount in a new production permit for a new use beyond the historically protected irrigation use was granted. It, it all happened simultaneously. However, there's a little bit of a wrench thrown in. A third party, another uh, producer in, within the district, filed a request for party status. And so the, the settlement uh, implementation of the settlement agreement has effectively been stayed by request of Fort Stockton Holdings and this third party pending the resolution of this request for party status. So things are on ice briefly, uh, but the, the, few, the few phases that remain are the finalization of the rulemaking and the ultimate entering uh, into a well-monitoring agreement between Fort Stockton Holdings and, and the district. So that's where we are today. Um, Great, the thank, agreement. thanks, Troop. And so it's sounding like, you know, you, you alluded to there being various parties involved in this settlement. And so I think uh, Kristen and, and Emily, if you would weigh in kind of on what that looked like for the other parties um, kind of on the outskirts of this and, and how that settlement all came together. Uh, yes, like Troop mentioned, it was not only did the applicant settle with the district, then there was the other uh, big protestants that were involved, which included City of Fort Stockton, Pecos County, and then also my client, which is a retail water supplier out in that area. And from my client's perspective, obviously the um, regulatory certainty was huge for them in addition to some mitigation. So it was, this was a, in my opinion, a really good um, template for, you know, other, where there's conflict in other areas to see how this was resolved. It truly was, and, and kudos to the team that, that did the initial settlement with the district. Um, it really is, I think, landmark and, and shows the kind of uh, coming to the table that can happen with as many parties and as complicated of a history as, as there can be. So that's from my perspective and my client's perspective why it was really important, and I'm glad to see and I hope to see that applied in other areas as well.
Well, good. and so does, if anyone has any comments on any, any other takeaways for districts, but I think, Kristen, that summed it up, up well that, that this was um, constructive for, for everybody involved. Um, Okay, well, we will move on to a, a case that we really think, you know, implicates GCD rules and, and their implementation. And Vanessa's going to tell us about this Wimberley Springs Partners versus Wimberley Valley Watershed Association, which also, the, the important party that falls out of the style in that is, is the Hayes Trinity Groundwater Conservation District. And so, Vanessa, if you'll tell us about kind of what, what the background is on that case and where it is today. Sure. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background and then the procedural history and then we can kind of talk about some of the takeaways from this case. It's really more of an administrative procedures case, less about groundwater. It just happens that it was the rule of a groundwater conservation district that is at issue and that was being interpreted. And so it, it centers around the Hayes Trinity Groundwater Conservation District's uh, rule that um, basically informed non-applicants as to when um, they are supposed to file a contested case request. Mm -hmm. And these are old rules. Um, Hayes Trinity has since amended its rules. So it's not really applicable right now in, in the sense of that specific rule. But um, there are some things I think that we can learn from the case. Um, basically what happened is that Wimberley Springs Partners um, applied for a groundwater permit with um, at the Hayes Trinity Groundwater Conservation District. This was uh, back in uh, 2011. And Hayes Trinity held a hearing. There were no formal protests that were uh, submitted and so they granted the permit. Um, after they granted the permit, uh, the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association, which is a nonprofit landowner in the area um, and several other landowners filed a contested case request um, protesting that permit, and Wimberley Springs Partners filed a motion with Hayes Trinity arguing that um, the request was untimely, and um, that's because they argued that the rules only permitted applicants to file contested case requests after the permit has been issued, and that non-applicants were supposed to submit prior to um, the permit being issued. So um, Hayes Trinity uh, granted Wimberley Springs Partners motion and uh, denied Wimberley Valley's contested case request. Um, Wimberley Valley then appealed that request to district court in Hayes County and the district court um, ruled in favor of Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. There's a lot of Wimberleys here, so they ruled in favor of the you know, potential protestants and um, held that Hayes Trinity had acted arbitrarily and capriciously and abused its discretion when uh, they denied Wimberley Valley's uh, contested case request. So Wimberley Springs and Hayes Trinity um, appealed this decision to the third court and it took almost four years for the third court to reach a decision. I, we, and I didn't mention, I'm actually on the board of the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association. I was not on the board when this case came around, so I'm not really that familiar with all the details until um, this uh, Third Court of Appeals decision came out. Um, so, you know, we often wondered, uh, did they just lose it? Was it <laughs> under a pile of papers? We really didn't know why it took so long. but. Um, took four years and um, they overturned the district court's ruling and um, held that uh, basically Hayes Trinity's interpretation of their rule was reasonable and that a reasonable person would have been able to ascertain that they should have filed a contested case request prior to the board issuing the permit. So um, where we are now is that, uh, that was in May, that where the third court issued its um, ruling, and the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association has filed a motion for rehearing and, and bank uh, reconsideration. And the central argument, I think, of the case right now is really whether the rules provided um, fair notice or due process to applicants um, regarding you know, that deadline. Well, and I think that this brings up an important point probably for, for everybody in the audience. And I guess I'm going to ask a multi-pronged question that then 
anybody who wants to can, can kind of jump in and answer the different prongs of that. But I mean, do we, do we think that the same thing would happen today? I, I feel like maybe changes in Chapter 36 in the recent years um, on, on what districts have to have in their rules regarding a deadline for uh, filing a request for a contested case hearing might, might mitigate this. I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts. And then you know, what, what would be a takeaway that y'all would give for districts in thinking about and drafting the procedural rules? And, and you know, what, are, what are maybe some ways that districts can you know, avoid getting in this situation in the first place. So lots of questions there, but it gives kind of some fodder for discussion here. Yeah, I mean, I think that in last session in 2015, um, thir section 36.415 was amended that requires districts to establish a deadline for non-applicants um, to submit a contested case request. So I think that specific issue you know, has been addressed, but I think the larger issue is that it still provides districts with a lot of discretion, and so therefore there isn't going to be uniformity in um, some of these procedural rules. So I, mean, I think one takeaway could be that um, whereas um, with other state agencies we have the Administrative Procedures Act that um, basically provides that, that structure for these um, these contested case requests and hearings, that um, you know maybe a, a parallel is needed in the groundwater district world. Um, so you know that that could be one takeaway. Whether it's the legislature actually, you know, enacting laws that would guide that, create that, or whether it's a, a model set of uh, rules. But I think that that the groundwater districts could maybe benefit from a uniform set of procedures. And I would just add that it's really important for districts to make sure they do have cl clear procedural rules. That will help you avoid some of these things going forward. Um, you want to fill in the gaps that Chapter 36 hasn't provided so that if you're looking at it from the outside, you could follow the rules and you know what was supposed to happen. Well said. <laughs> yeah, and I think another issue is that in this case, apparently um, the general manager um, actually told the Wimberley Valley Watershed Association and some of the other landowners that, that they could submit their contested case request after the board issued its permit. So they probably, sh they should not have relied on that information from the staff because it's really the board that's the one that should be interpreting the rules um, and you know there's law around around that but um, you know I, I, I do feel like it it would have probably behooved um, the general manager and the board to have consulted with their attorney and you know I just think that it, that really when you're dealing with contested case requests um, you know the, the general manager's job is to just process that. And I talked with Greg Ellis, who represents Hayes Trinity, and you said something interesting, you know, the general manager should not be interpreting the rules, and if you take another approach, then staff's really getting to rewrite the rules. So I think that's an important consideration. All right. Well, great. Thank you for their, um, that discussion. We'll move on now to uh, the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District versus City of Conroe case regarding immunity. And Troop's going to tell us about that. Drew Miller talked about this um, case yesterday, too. But um, Troop, if you'll just kind of um, give us the, the lowdown on, on that case and kind of where it is. Sure, absolutely. And first and foremost, our, our thoughts and prayers are with uh, Kathy and her district out there as they face yet another challenge uh, in the form of the, the damage and destruction caused by the hurricane. But um, did get a bit of good news back in February. Um, again, I think this is something that most folks in the room are familiar with to some degree, but uh, fundamentally the suit is uh, a rule challenge uh, to the district's rules. And um, there were some preliminary motions filed on, at the district court level and some rulings on those motions that were appealed to uh, the Court of Appeals in Beaumont. So again, talking about preliminary issues here, specifically pertaining to immunity and uh, the award of attorney's fees. Uh, so the, the district court had ruled that the directors were not immune from suit and the suit could pr proceed with the directors attached to it also, the district would be on the hook for attorney's fees. Uh, fortunately, in, in February, the Court of, Court of Appeals reversed that ruling, saying, uh, district uh, directors, yes, you are immune from suit from your, for your official votes and actions, and no district, you are not going to be on the hook for, for attorney's fees in this suit. 
Uh, so the proceedings were remanded back to the district court level. Uh, you know, the, the initial filings um, were pretty complex, a lot of issues, but now that it's back on remand, it's pretty much parsed down to the fundamental issue, the, the rule challenge. So uh, the uh, large water producers, as they've been named in this case, filed a motion for summary judgment, I believe, at the end of July, uh, saying simply the, the rules are void as a matter of law, please strike them. And uh, I think the, the district answered about two weeks ago or so with a uh, reply to the motion for summary judgment and their own cross motion for summary judgment saying, no, the, the rules are legit as a matter of law, dismiss the suit and let us uh, get on with our business here. So um, at their pretty early stages on, on remand back at the district court, so we'll, we'll keep everybody uh, tuned in on that. Good. It sounds like that's moving forward on the merits, and, uh, and but we've got some answers on immunity. So, All right. And also having to do with the Lone Star Groundwater Conservation District, Emily's going to tell us about the petitions that have been filed regarding the DFCs there. So obviously there's a lot of litigation going on between various parties in this matter, but um, the, in December of 2016, an uh, entity called QuadVest Quad LP, which is an investor-owned utility in Montgomery County, and also in a separate petition, Conroe and Magnolia, Man, Mag, I can't say the word today, Magnolia <laughs> filed uh, petitions with the district to challenge their DFCs. Um, basically, those petitions allege that the district failed to properly consider effects on private um, property and the socioeconomic effects. Um, they basically said you're effectively condemning our stored groundwater and that they complained that the DFC for Lone Star was different than other DFCs in the same, um, in, in neighboring counties in the same aquifer. So the way this procedure goes, those petitions get filed with the district. The district then sends them over to the Texas Water Development Board who needs to prepare a scientific and techni technical report analyzing the DFC and submit that to the State Office of Administrative Hearings. In April of this year, the Water Development Board did submit that report. And that study centered on if and how the best available science was incorporated in the DFCs adopted by Lone Star. And the study, the, in the study, the Water Development Board found that the best available science and data was used on aquifer uses and conditions, water supply and management strategies, hydrological um, conditions, environmental impacts, and subsidence. There were three issues, or two issues, excuse me, that the Water Development Board, I would say, punted on. Um, on the socioeconomic impacts, the Water Development Board said, hey, we don't know what basis a district is supposed to use to determine socioeconomic impacts, so we can't make a determination about whether or not they use the best available data. Okay. Um, on private property rights issue, the Water Development Board said that these issues were beyond their scientific and technical report. So you've got two issues that are just there. Those are the issues that are going to be litigated in the uh, in the SOA case. And, and the Water Development Board has provided no guidance as far as I could see on that. Um, but in the end, the Water Development Board said for the feasibility of achieving the DFC, the, the DFCs for individual districts are feasible because the DFCs are based on regional hydrologic and groundwater conditions. So basically, they've said the DFCs are feasible, but out, dis, uh, conditions outside the district could, affect the, could impact the district's ability to meet those DFCs. So you have these two petitions that have been filed. They're consolidated in a contested case hearing before SOA. Right now, the, in the procedure, they had a preliminary hearing in May. They're, they're going through discovery right now. I know there's been depositions of various people who are not involved in the case. Um, Pre-filed testimony, that's where you do your direct case and you write out your testimony, is due at the end of September, and they're supposed to go to hearing on the merits in the first week or so, first part of November. We'll see if that actually stays that same schedule considering Harvey and everything that's going on there. But for now, we look like we'll have a contested case hearing the first part of November. And so this 
next year at this time, we might have more to discuss about how it, the outcome comes of it. I mean, I, we think, I'm pretty, I think we're all pretty confident this is the first DFC appeal under the, the statute that was adopted in the, with the new procedure. So, you know, this Lone Star is getting to make the, you know, how the procedure goes and let's see if the, if the water code and what they set up works. Any? I have a quick follow-up question kind of on that, on, on those two issues that, that have gone to so now on the socioeconomic factors and, and private property rights that the, it sounds like the Water Development Board kind of said this is outside, either outside our purview or we don't have enough information to make further determinations on it. What do you all see happening as a result of this first case? And um, do, you, do you see... A, a result coming out of the, the SOA proceeding and then maybe any appeal of that um, that would resolve those issues, that would give districts more guidance and give the Water Development Board more guidance, or do you see that as needing to come from the legislature eventually to flesh out those factors that are supposed to be considered, but that may be challenging for everybody? Well, I would say that it would probably have been better to come from the legislature how they wanted those issues to be fleshed out, but the first PFD, that ALJ will analyze it, so these parties are really going to give us a template about what should be considered. So whatever the ALJ says, you know, if they say, yes, that, that's a factor you can consider, or that's not a factor that was important, that's going to provide a template for the rest, of, uh, the rest of parties going forward, other districts and people that want to challenge a DFC, what do we need to be looking at? So Emily, did you say that the Water Development Board said that pumping from outside of the district could affect the DFC? Uh, that's my understanding okay. of what their their um, analysis was. Yeah. I mean, it just it's, I mean, I feel like that's an ongoing issue mm -hmm. in a variety of ways about the impact that other districts pumping has on the DFC. For, sure. So yeah, yeah this will be the first stab at. At, at that issue, but yeah, it sounds like LJ will get the first stab at kind of answering answering these questions. You know, on the socioeconomic impact, the one thing that it, it, I think the district looked at the effect of subsidence and how that would that the, as the socioeconomic impact, whereas these groundwater users are saying your limits on my ability to pump groundwater, that's the socioeconomic impact. So there's, there's kind of two different ways that it's being looked at. So we'll see going forward whether or not you can, it has to be the actual pumping of the groundwater as a socioeconomic impact or if it's some other kind of result of the pumping. Anything? Great, well that'll be one to watch for sure. All right, I think we'll move on now to a category where we're going we're gonna to talk about three different cases, um, either applications or, or some have become cases, um, that we think have some common themes here. And, and this is the general theme of landowner concerns, but either for their wells or for, for their interest in groundwater. If they don't have wells, they may still have, as landowners, have their, their interest in groundwater that they may want to protect, and they're kind of going about this in different ways. So um, I think we're going to start out, Vanessa, I think it's going to tell us about the application of, of need more water, and we'll move on, and then Vanessa, if you'll get sure. us started with that one. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, in my opinion, results of, of the day case is that it's empowered a lot of landowners that I think otherwise wouldn't have felt they had the tools to um, basically try to protect their groundwater from being drained. And so I feel like we're starting to see a little bit um, more friction uh, between landowners with groundwater districts sort of being in the middle. Um, so I uh, work for the Trinity Edward Springs Protection Association. I'm the executive director and general counsel. And um, we uh, filed a contested case request against an application that Need More Water LLC uh, submitted um, before the Barton Springs Edwards Aquifer <laughs> Conservation District. Um, we have lots of members that live near um, this property that were concerned about their groundwater uh, being drained. And um, so we submitted a contested case request and we were just granted standing at SOA um, in July. So it's still pretty early, and we're kind of uh, we've developed a you know schedule, procedural schedule. Emily represents um, 
the district. Um, but you know, so we're, there's still a lot to to see where that goes. It's very beginning. <laughs> All right, and, and Troop, if you'll tell us about the Brazos Valley Groundwater Rights Association and what, what they are, are bringing before. Just sure, before. sure, another unique proceeding. Um, so landowner and um, uh, local groundwater uh, rights association uh, filed a document styled as a complaint uh, with the Brazos Valley GCD and made two primary allegations. First, uh, complaining over an application issued in 2006 timeframe by the city of Bryan. The allegation is that when the, submit, the city submitted that application, they falsified critical information within that application. And so on that basis, the complainants request that the district hold a hearing to allow the complainants to introduce that evidence and upon conclusion of the hearing, immediately revoke the city's permit. In the alternative, the complainants allege that uh, their, their nearby property is being drained from the city, by the city from, as a result of the production pursuant to that permit. So the complainants request that the district initiate an involuntary amendment uh, proceeding to that permit and reduce the authorized production to an amount that uh, does not cause drainage. Uh, so the complainants also requested a, a SOA hearing uh, on their complaint. District granted that, so we're, we've been kicked over to SOA, and we have three parties to the proceeding. There's the city of Bryan, there are the complainants, the, the landowner and the uh, Groundwater Rights Association, and then the district's kind of the, the man in the middle here, um, along with everybody. So we uh, had, had a preliminary hearing in July to, to, select, to select schedules and, and arrange schedules. Uh, but we've had some issues come up. We've got a little bit of a discovery dispute. There's a pending motion to abate. Uh, we had a judge, an ALJ reassigned, a uh, different judge to the case last week. Um, so working out some issues uh, preliminarily. But we do have dispositive issues, uh, uh, motions due soon. Uh, and you know, another note, the, the same parties, the complainants, the landowner, filed kind of in the same time frame a takings lawsuit uh, against the district alleging as, as a result of drainage and um, also has filed his own permit application that's been amended uh, once or twice. So um, sort of a unique proceeding, landowner kind of figuring out how he needs to protect his rights in groundwater. All right, and Kristen, if you'll go ahead and tell us about the Lost Pines DCD case. And this one's along the lines of a little bit what we've heard in terms of the topic, but um, overall, to give you a brief overview, that's actually currently pending, so we're going to see how this turns out. But um, the plaintiffs were denied party status at the uh, contested case hearing level at the district, and then that matter went before SOA, where a hearing was conducted. And um, through a number of procedural matters that they were appealed, the landowners that were denied party status appealed that case, and a number of different actions that then were recently consolidated. So um, now we're, we have that case pending in uh, Bastrop County District Court. Really, the for me, you know, one of the takeaways, I guess, is really that that um, interpretation of 36415B, which is the party status, how districts look to whether or not to grant party status to protestants, and particularly what the what the statute says. That latter part says that um, party status does not include persons who have an interest common to members of the public. And the way that the Lost Pines District, they interpreted that was that you either had to have actual or intended use for that. And the landowners in this case, there are three landowners, one of which owns wells. She owns two wells, but is not currently using those. And two landowners do not own any wells or have any specific plans to, to use water in the near future or any plans in place. And then environmental stewardship is, a, is along the same lines and, and no wells in particular. So um, the arguments from those landowners is that they have the right to conserve their groundwater in place based on the day decision along the lines of what Vanessa said. Uh, there's some really um, interesting arguments that have come out of that, including whether oil and gas law should be applied, um, although it's coming at it from a different angle, you know, the, the conservation angle, the right to to conserve that groundwater in place and, and save it for the future, that fair share. And so, like I mentioned, that's currently pending. There is a hearing in October on this case, currently scheduled, and so we will see. I think that's one of the takeaways from my perspective is, uh, guest districts in particular, hang tight, uh, because we will see, and you'll get a, hopefully a little bit of guidance as to what this, uh, that party status in 36415 means, and uh, and then we'll know how to apply it once we see what this how this case comes out. Yeah, I, I think that's that's going to be a really important and interesting issue, that standing issue, and I think we'll get some standing law out of this, mm -hmm. depending on how far up it goes. Standing law that really goes beyond Chapter 36. I mean, this is this is a standing question about what what does it mean to have an interest common to the public, and uh, does this property ownership itself overlying an aquifer does that is does that differentiate you enough from the public? 
to have a justiciable interest. And, and so I think that we'll get some really interesting standing law out of this that maybe, I don't know if there's anywhere else in the country that has ad addressed that standing question regarding groundwater. I don't know that anybody else has the framework of Texas groundwater law and ownership that we do to have addressed that. I'm, I'm speculating here, I don't know, maybe somewhere else that has come up. But um, and so I, I'm gonna ask another one of my multi-pronged questions that then each of you can take up in, in kind of whatever way you want regarding these issues. But you know, there, there seem to be the common themes here of landowners coming with, the, with these concerns. So, you know, one question is what are, what are the similarities between these concerns, but then also what are the differences? Because I think we're, we're seeing some of these protestants or plaintiffs coming at their concept of their ownership of groundwater in, in different ways. Um, so, so those would be kind of a, a dichotomy there you could address. And then, you know, another prong of my, my many questions is, how did we get here and where are we going? I mean, those are huge questions, but you know, this is kind of a new trend, I think, in cases that we haven't really seen before. So if, if you want to address that, and then finally, and maybe most importantly, uh, where are districts in all of this? You know, where, where are districts finding themselves? And so just each of you, however you want to take those questions and whatever you want to add to that, um, I think these are interesting issues. And we can, we can just go down the row, or I don't know if you want to just uh, jump sure. in. Sure, no, I'll, I'll start. Uh, well, in the need more application case, you know, we've uh, submitted a protest. We, well, we've submitted a protest, you know, before the district has issued a permit. We have landowners that um, have wells and, and are, that are members of TESPA, and then we have some landowners that do not have wells. So, um, you know, we're trying to involve ourselves in this situation at the forefront. Um, I think that's slightly different than, than what Troop was talking about, where there's a landowner that's trying to intervene after a permit has been issued and you know, is concerned that his groundwater is being drained. So you know, I think one interesting point is if you're denied standing because you don't have a well at the time a, um, you know, a permit is granted, but then down the road, you try to you end up drilling a well and you're you're not allowed to intervene at that point. You know what what recourse does a landowner have? One thing that I find interesting with all these cases is the competing values that different landowners place on the water. So you really have property rights questions on both sides. You have the well permittee mm -hmm. or applicant who wants to drill and produce his groundwater competing against the other landowners in the area who don't want that big well to be put in place. And who's in the middle is the groundwater districts. And so there's a, there's a fine line to walk there between the competing values of, of the landowners for that, that resource. I think my takeaway or one of my points here is I remember when the day case came out and the question was is how does that apply to us and, and some of the answer was we don't really know and I believe now we're in that period kind of like oil and gas was many years ago where we're seeing that litigation we're seeing a lot more litigation now this is probably this conference I've noticed you know in the last um, couple conferences I've been at where we're talking about a lot more cases as you can tell uh, there's not just one or two cases on the agenda for us to talk about up here so we're in that period where there's going to be quite a bit of litigation to figure out where exactly what does they mean and what does that and, and you're going to have the two different sides uh, not necessarily one of those not necessarily being the district but the two different sides of landowners you know for example the landowners that are claiming they have the investment backed expectation they have wells drilled and infrastructure in place versus those that are wanting to conserve it in place and possibly uh, produce in the future. So I think that those two, and, and like Emily said, that there'll be a little bit of the district saying, hey, give me some direction here while these landowners go and fight over what, what this means. And I guess from a district perspective, that's a good thing to be, to be sort of waiting on some of that guidance. But that's where I see this headed in basically litigation to figure out exactly what day means and the impl implementation of that. Yeah, and just echo on, on on Kristen's comments there. It's it's we're starting to kind of see this evolution or shift or, or, or rise in suits that aren't permittee versus district, but they're permittee versus permittee, landowner versus permittee, potential permittee versus existing permittee, and uh, the district's kind of always caught up in the middle of that. So, um, you know, thinking about uh, Chief Justice's comments yesterday about um, you know does does Texas need a special water court? And assuming that you know litigation continues to arise in this fashion, you know not necessarily directly involving the district, but but the district's kind of a playing referee more or less. 
uh, GCDs kind of take on that, that role indirectly as that, that, fund, that baseline, that on the ground water court to help resolve these, these disputes between landowners. And I think that's a, um, an interesting development. Um, and I, I think you know, the question for me is why is the district caught in the middle? And I think, well, part of that is because of the rule of capture, because you know, a landowner can't sue another landowner. So they're looking to the district to protect them. And so that's another question is, you know, is it the job of a groundwater district to, to protect landowners' rights to conserve their groundwater in place? And, you know, Day doesn't address that. And, um, and I, I kind of wanted to ask just to pick that yesterday, but, <laughs> you know, so that's, you know, there's a lot of questions. Yeah. No, I, I think these are really interesting ones. We'll, we'll have, I think, um, as one of you said, now I can't remember who, we, you know, we'll have many years of, of litigation uh, ahead of us to get some of these answers. Okay, according to, I'm, I'm probably about to get my time limit here. According to my watch, I'm eating into your break. According to, my, oh, I have a Twitter question. Twitter question? Wow. <laughs> yes. Okay. Regarding the Brazos Valley suit, uh, will the GCD be held liable for a taking for permitting when the pumper is immune under the rule of capture? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Will the GCD be held liable for a taking for permitting when the pumper is immune under the rule of capture? There's that, that middle of the road <laughs> conundrum, Stay right? Stay tuned would be my answer in short, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's, that that's certainly an issue. Uh, that's an it's understandable a good one. question. There's a takings claim that's, that's waiting in the wings uh, pending resolution of this suit. So, um, you know, is there a taking by inaction or indirect action? You know, there's, there's been no district action with regard to this specific landowner. Um, so how can a takings be, ju be just opposed in that um, situation? So we'll, we'll, we'll see. Yeah, I think Vanessa's rhetorical question just now kind of went to that, that question as well, um, which is, it, it does, do, do districts have a duty to, and, and if they do, will they be held liable for, you know, for protecting a landowner from the results of the rule of capture? Um, those are, those are tricky ones that, that we've got coming, I think. And I, I think some of this is going to be resolved in, in standing issues, too. So, uh, okay, so we, we are, just like I knew we would be pushing up against our time limit. We've got about five minutes, according to my stopwatch. We've got um, this one, I think, um, we'll, we'll probably touch on briefly. Emily's going to update us on Texas versus New Mexico, mostly so that we can talk about um, where we have the intersection of groundwater and surface water law. Um, so, Emily, if you'll give us a, just kind of a, a brief update on where that case is and, w and why we care about it here. Yeah. So, recall Texas sued New Mexico in an original um, suit that they filed with the United States Supreme Court. I think it was in 2014 that that suit was filed. These cases go really, really slow. Um, New Mexico filed a motion to dismiss that case. Um, but if you recall what the... This, case is, is that Texas is alleging that New Mexico has violated the 1938 Rio Grande Compact by allowing the diversion of surface water and groundwater that is hydrologically connected to the Rio Grande after the water is released from Ele Elephant Butte. So it's basically saying you're not, we're, Texas isn't getting the delivery of all the water that it's supposed to because you've allowed New Mexico people to drill wells. Um, the, that pool water that is hydrologically connected, groundwater that's hydrologically connected to the Rio Grande, therefore taking Texas's allotment of water. So New Mexico filed a motion to dismiss. Several parties asked to intervene. In February of this year, the special uh, master um, published, I would say published, I don't know, issued his report on those motions to intervene. It's 278 pages long, and it is a treatise of basically Rio Grande compact history. So if you're interested in any of that, I would go read it. Um, but basically, the, the special master is recommending that the United States Supreme Court deny New Mexico's motion to dismiss, deny the intervention of two of the irrigation districts that have asked to intervene, and to deny United States, the United States is also asked to intervene, to deny the United States' intervention request if it, to the extent that it cannot state a plausible claim under the 1938 Rio Grande Compact, real technical stuff not worth really going into. We're a long way away from the resolution of that case, but really what's the interesting point is that it is about this, this connection between groundwater and surface water. 
Um, so it, it will be good going forward to see how the United States Supreme Court addresses that. One thing I'll note that this is an issue that's ongoing and currently in the San Saba River Basin, the TCEQ is pursuing enforcement actions against groundwater uh, well owners who the TCEQ is saying you are pulling groundwater, your, your groundwater that you're pulling is actually surface water and is so you don't have the right to take that water. You need to have a water right, a surface water right, to be able to pump that from those groundwater wells. So we see this ongoing with several enforcement actions that TCEQ is pursuing for those kinds of issues. And so the, the dynamic there is, well, what if you're in a groundwater district? Who are those folks? Are those groundwater well owners, are they looking, who are they talking to? Right. So. You want to add anything to that? Yeah, I think generally, like Emily said, we're seeing landowners that have wells want some protection or, or some interaction with the district about what they have and their right. But then there's the question when you're along surface water bodies like that of whether it's state or, you know, state or groundwater, state-owned water or groundwater. So I think luckily it looks like, well, maybe a while, but we'll get some resolution on that. So for GCDs that have that issue, hopefully you'll have some guidance as to what that is. And then you have some TCEQ, obviously, in their pleadings and whatnot. You have some TCEQ um, arguments that you can rely on to say, hey, here's what we think our authority is as GCDs and, and go from there. And that's what I would say for GCDs at the current uh, time is to, to wait and see, but then also know that you have TCQ guidance in some of their arguments to rely on in terms of your protection of certain wells and where they are located along surface water bodies. One thing I'll say, the TCQ defines underflow of a river to mean the water that's directly under the river, but also on the lateral sides of the river that flows in the same direction as the river. So the question then is, is that really the only water that's hydrologically connected to the river? I, th I think you mentioned you had a study in well, Hayes yeah, County. Well, in, in, um, yeah, in Hayes County, uh, several hydrogeologists have just, they completed a study, I think it was last year, a uh, gain loss study on Onion Creek, where they basically found that um, Onion Creek uh, is recharged, surface water from Onion Creek is recharging the Middle Trinity Aquifer. So, um, you know, they did a chemical analysis of wells that were near the creek and actually discovered that there was surface water in those wells. Um, so, you know, we are, I think we are, my, my hope is that, you know, as we are having more of these studies, perhaps as maybe we get some law here that, you know, we'll continue to kind of move toward really integrating groundwater and surface water, um, at least in our groundwater law. And, and I wonder if maybe the TCEQ's definition is maybe a bit simplistic, and that that's kind of where I'm thinking this might go is that that's too sounds too easy to say it's just going in the same direction yeah and there may be fleshing out of that to do in the future as we get more studies on on these interconnections and I'm sure there'll be more of those going forward um, okay as I expected we've run out of time basically before our last slide I think what I'll do is just say that as we heard the Chief Justice talking about yesterday and as as we know the Texas courts are, are moving toward oil and gas and applying and using oil and gas law. We are familiar with the Coyote Lake Ranch case. Um, Lightning Oil Company versus Anadarko is another new oil and gas case that has some implications that I think we now know will will probably maybe someday could could apply to groundwater as well, though we haven't seen it in that context yet. Uh, a panelist, I'll turn it over to you for like one more minute if you want to kind of just touch on these I'll briefly or... We'll, we'll skip. Everyone knows Coyote Lake, and just the update on that, the motion for rehearing was denied, but I think the more implication is how it's being applied in other areas. Right, and, and the Chief Justice yesterday, you know, specifically mentioned the expansion of oil and gas uh, into groundwater law in regards to trespass, and that's what this case is about. So I called, this was the, uh, the Jim Murphy special right here. Jim and I were uh, having a drink at TWCA at the reception back in June, and I uh, started talking about work. I'm sure that's my fault, Jim, so I apologize. But uh, Jim mentioned a case that he had read about that was recently, a decision recently issued by the Texas Supreme Court uh, in May of this year, uh, an oil and gas case. This is not an application of oil and gas law into groundwater. It's just something that, that we flagged as, uh, is interesting. Um, so the, the issue is, is potential trespass, and you've got uh, two, two oil and gas operators, Anadarko and Lightning, going at each other. Um, <coughs> real quick summary. Anadarko enters into a mineral lease with uh, the state over some state property, the, the Chaparral Wildlife Management Area down uh, on the way towards Laredo off 35. 
And um, you know, being a wildlife management area, the state says, okay, Anadarko, well, here's your mineral lease, but if at all feasible, do not drill from the surface over here. So Anadarko says, all right, goes to the, the ranch next door. Ranch next door has their minerals leased to Lightning. Uh, but Anadarko says, you know, I just need a surface lease with you so I can get my, my well drilled, get the horizontal well to go under the neighboring state property so I don't disturb the surface over there. Uh, Lightning, the, the mineral interest owner of the, of the ranch, sues, saying, when you drill this well, this is going to be a trespass into my mineral interest. Uh, so just real briefly, the, uh, you know, the key question kind of is, uh, whose permission is necessary for an oil and gas operator uh, to drill through a mineral interest that they do not own to reach the mineral interest that they do have an interest in? Uh, and so you're kind of rewording that or rethinking that in the groundwater context, you know, whose permission would be necessary for, for a water well driller or a permittee uh, in order for them to drill through a mineral state to get to groundwater or to drill horizontally, you know, in a similar context to the, the Anadarko and the Lightning Oil case. So the Supreme Court held that uh, Lightning, no, you do not have a sufficient injury to uh, maintain an action in trespass. Uh, so a couple quotes from, from the court here. Uh, Ownership of property does not necessarily include the right to exclude every invasion or interference based on what might at first blush uh, seem to be rights attached to the ownership. Secondly, uh, the rights conveyed by a mineral lease generally encompass the rights to explore, obtain, produce, and possess the mineral subject to the lease. However, they, they do not include the right to possess the specific place or space where the minerals are located. Thus, unauthorized interference with the place where the minerals are located uh, can be a trespass only if the interference uh, infringes upon the mineral lessee's ability to exercise his right in those minerals. So just something to think about going forward. Again, nothing that's been, been applied in the groundwater context, but certainly has some implications that I think folks can see the, the parallels there. All right. Well, thank you for giving us part of your break as, as part of our panel. But in, in, please join me now in, in thanking uh, our panelists for all their insights. <laughs>